This morning, we will spend some time meditating upon what is probably one of the most difficult passages in Scripture. It is a difficult passage because I'm sure you will know it evokes, it arouses strong emotional responses from us. As I prepared this sermon during the week, it wouldn't be a lie to say to you that I prepared this sermon with tears in my own eyes just because it is so, so challenging. Please turn with me to 2 Samuel in chapter 12. We'll read the whole passage together, and then by the help of the Holy Spirit, we will seek to draw principles from this passage in order to help us in our times of grief. 2 Samuel chapter 12. And the Lord sent Nathan to David, came to him, and said to him, There were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb which he had bought. And he brought it up, and he grew up with him and with his children, and it used to eat of his morsel and drink from his cup and lie in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the guest who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man and said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. David said to, or Nathan said to David, you are the man. Now thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you out of the hand of Saul, and I gave you your master's house, your master's wives to your arms, and I gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if this were too little, I would add to you as much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and and have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of of Uriah the Hittite, to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will rise up evil against you out of your own house, and I will take your wives from before your wives and give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of the sun. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the sun. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, The Lord has put away your sin, you shall not die. Nevertheless, because by this deed you have utterly scorned the Lord, the child who is born to you shall die. Then Nathan went to his house. And the Lord afflicted the child that Uriah's wife bore to David, and he became sick. David therefore sought to the Lord on behalf of the child, and David fasted and went in and lay all night on the ground. And the elders of his house stood beside him to uh, raise him from the ground, but he would not, nor did he eat food with them. On the seventh day, the child died. And the servants of David were afraid to tell them that the child was dead, for they said, Behold, 
while the child was yet alive, we spoke to him and he did not listen to us. How then can we say to him, the child is dead? He may do himself some harm. When David saw his servants were whispering together, David understood that the child was dead. And David said to his servants, is the child dead? And they said, he is dead. Then David arose from the earth, washed and anointed himself and changed his clothes. And he went into the house of the Lord and worshipped. And then he went to his own house. And when they asked, they, and when he asked, they set food before him and he ate. When the servants said to him, what is this thing you have done? You fasted and wept for the child while he was alive. But when the child died, you arose and ate food. He said, while the child was alive, I fasted and wept for I said, who knows whether the Lord will be gracious to me that the child may live. But now he is dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he will not return to me. Then David comforted his wife Bathsheba and went in to her and lay with her. She bore a son, and he called his name Solomon, and the Lord loved him. And he sent a message by Nathan the prophet, and so he called his name Jedidiah because of the Lord. This is the word of God this morning. I'm sure that most of you have heard the phrase, no parent should bury a child. It is one of the most painful things that anyone will ever have to experience. And perhaps this morning, that is something that some of you may not be unfamiliar with. If you have ever lost a child, if you have ever lost a loved one, you may have doubted the godness of God. In situations like that, it's, it's difficult for us, it's, it's hard for us because we think that God must be unloving, that God must be unkind, that, that God must be unjust to do such a cruel thing. You may have heard those words uttered from those whom you have interacted with, you may have even uttered those words yourselves. In, tem in situations like we find in front of us this morning, the temptation can be that we use our circumstances to interpret the character of God. We use our earthly experiences and that causes us to project a particular image upon God. But rather, as we, as we study this passage this morning, what I hope you will see is that the character of God, rather than being interpreted by our circumstances, the character of God must be that which counsels us through our circumstances. Now, before we dig into this chapter, I, I just want to very briefly just unpack something of the context of what's happening here. I'm sure many of you know this, you know your Bibles well. In 2 Samuel and chapter 11, we read that in the spring of the year, when it was time for the kings to go out to battle, where was David? He wasn't on the battlefield, he sent Joab to do this. He stayed home. Instead of fulfilling the responsibilities of being king, he simply sent someone else to do that. Instead of going out with the army, instead of leading them, David remained in Jerusalem. And while he was walking on top of the palace roof, there he saw Bathsheba performing the, the cultural ceremonial cleansing. And it was from that point onwards that he lured her into his bedroom. Once David found out that Bathsheba was pre pregnant, he, he crafted this elaborate plan. He thought to himself, let's get Uriah to come back from the battlefield. Once he's here, let's 
uh, fill him with wine. Let's get him intoxicated so that he'll go home and sleep with his wife and all of this will be covered up. But that didn't work, did it? David's plan backfired on him. And so now he's, he, he can't cover his sin. And so he thinks to himself, well, I'm going to kill Uriah. So he sends a letter back to the commander of his army, Joab, with Uriah's own hand. It's his own death warrant that he gives to the commander of the army, and through that we know that Uriah has died. Terrible sin performed on David's account. What's interesting is that as we read further back in the Old Testament, in the book of Deuteronomy, as God reveals to his people how the king was supposed to act, he says this in Deuteronomy 17 and verse 18. He says, So when the king sits on the throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself a book, a copy of this law that is approved by the Levitical priests. And it shall be with him, and he shall read it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God by keeping all the words of his laws and these statutes. David had written down the law of God. So he knew what was the sixth and seventh commandment, just as I'm sure you know what is the sixth and seventh commandment. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. David knew this. He was a king who did not set rules by himself, but he was a king under God's authority. He was accountable to the Lord. And yet, he despised the word of God. And that's what we see Nathan rebuking him with, doesn't he? You have despised the word of the Lord in verse 9. You have rejected what God has revealed to you, and you have turned aside to your own way. You have broken God's word. You have turned away from the king of heaven. What is the consequence for that? What is the penalty for the man who sheds blood? What is the penalty for the man who lies with another man's wife? Death. The Old Testament and its ceremonial laws stipulate very clearly that the man who does these things shall die. David, as he sort of gets all worked up as Nathan comes to him and tells him the story about the rich man and the poor man. What does David say? He says, as, as the story is being expounded to him, David's anger is greatly kindled. And as the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. This man hasn't, the rich man at least, he hasn't killed someone he hasn't committed adultery has he he's stolen someone else's lamb and yet david feels such a deep sense of injustice because of this how much more so does david himself deserve that punishment upon his life and yet this is the very conundrum that bothers us about this passage because in verse 13, as David is confronted with his sin, we find no elaborate confession. David says to Nathan, I've sinned against the Lord. And Nathan says to David, the Lord has also put away your sin. David, the one who is guilty, the one who deserves to die, does not receive the, the punishment that is his. The, the man who has broken the law of God, the man who is guilty of violating God's command, the sentence is lifted off his head. Yet this child, who has done nothing, is killed. 
Isn't that unjust? Isn't God so cruel that Nathan would simply say a few words and then his sin is forgiven? And yet this child dies. So the first point that I want to unpack with you this morning is grievance in the midst of grief. Grievance in the midst of grief. From our vantage point, the character of God seems irreconcilable with our expectation of Him. If God is good, if God is kind and merciful and gracious and loving and steadfastly uh, kind, why does this child die? Even David, after he prays and fasts, after he, he seeks the Lord's face, why does God not relent? Why is God not merciful to him? God, you're being un-God. All those attributes that we would come before you and, and celebrate before you, all those attributes are hidden now. Why are you so unloving? Why are you so unjust? And in this moment, we would want to present our grievance against the Lord. You are meant to act in this way. Why don't you? Such a grievance is not just restricted to the death of a child, is it? Those of you who have lost loved ones, this may have been your experience when you've been wrestling through the death of a spouse, death of an uncle. Perhaps as you wrestled through some of your circumstances, as you've battled through moments like this in your life, you would want to lay the same grievance before God. In your experience, you might have had someone who was mistreated in hospital. I was thinking about Adrian Nathaniel, the pastor of Northmead Baptist. Simply went in for a, a small procedure. They nicked the wrong duct. After that, he gets septicemia and he passes away. Some of you may have been in situations where the doctor has told you that the procedure has gone well. The patient simply needs time to heal. But the next phone call you get is to find out that the person you've loved has passed away. Think about our dear brother Roger, who on one night gets on a flight to go to the UK expecting his sister to be better, but by the time he arrives, he finds out that his sister has passed away. Some of you may have lost children in your youth with their whole lives ahead of them, so much potential, so much gain to be had, so much hope in their lives. And yet they die. Some of you may have lost husbands or wives in unexpected ways. We think about uh, Peter Sammons a number of years ago when he went to go and fetch his car. His son says to him, I'll see you at home. And then he's crushed. In those moments, we would want to say to the Lord, why have you acted in these ways? You have promised to be with us. You have promised to be our comfort. You have promised to be our guide. And yet in these moments, you are not acting in that way. This conflict of grief and the character of God, I think is... Described very well by C.S. Lewis in his book. After the death of his spouse, C.S. Lewis records that his friends are, are coming to him and they're trying to comfort him and they're saying to him that she is at peace. She is at peace, they say. And then C.S. Lewis wrestles with this statement. He says, well, how do they know she is at peace? What gives them confidence to say that she is in such a state? 
The very concept of peace and rest are often communicated indiscriminately at funerals and memorial services, whether the person is a believer or not. How can they say to me that she is at peace? Well, because they are in the hands of God, they say. Or she is in the hands of God, they say. But C.S. Lewis doesn't like that answer. He says, well, if that's true, was she not in God's hands all the time? If God is meant to be good to us now and kind to us now and loving to us now, and yet she has been taken away by cancer, what gives me confidence to think that she will be better on the other side of the grave? He says this, Do his hands suddenly become gentler to us the moment we are out of the body? For in the only life we know, he hurts us beyond our fears and beyond that all that we can imagine. Then he may hurt us after death as unendurably as he did before. That is something that C.S. Lewis wrestles with. And that is something that you may have wrestled with. Do you see what C.S. Lewis is doing there? He's using his circumstances to define the character of God rather than using the word to define the character of God. You see, in moments like this, we may be tempted to believe that God is not acting like God. Or perhaps it may be more accurate to say that God is not acting like the God of our expectations The temptation is that our circumstances interpret the character of God. Rather, as I said before, the character of God, as he has revealed through his word, it is that which must give us comfort as we experience grief. And so second love, it's considered that a clear view of the character of God admonishes grief. I'm using the word admonish as the New Testament uses it. That it is the word of God that that counsels us in our situations. Let's go back to what's going on here in in 2 Samuel chapter chapter 12. In this moment, and, and I think we need to appreciate this, in this moment, David is experiencing a compendium of emotions. At first, David experienced guilt and shame and humiliation because of his sin. He's convicted. His heart is cut up as Nathan the prophet confronts him. But then it moves from guilt and shame and conviction to relief and comfort and peace, knowing that his sin has been forgiven. But then... It moves back to anxiety and fear because Nathan has declared that this child will die. But what keeps in this narrative hatred and animosity away? Why is that not one of the emotions that we see here? We see shame and humility and guilt We see peace and comfort. We see fear and anxiety, but not anger. Not animosity towards God. Why? The reason, and we'll unpack this, I believe is because David has a clear view about the character of God. What we see David doing here is a response to, to what God has revealed in his word. Instead of anger or resentment, David entrusts himself to God. We see that in verse 22, don't we? So the servants are quite confused about David's actions. You know, why are you fasting and praying while the child was alive, but now that he's dead, you don't do those things? Here's David's reasoning. Well, he says in verse 22... While the child was still alive, I fasted and wept, for I said, Who knows whether the Lord will be gracious to me that the child may live? David here is acknowledging that 
God is a gracious God. But God's grace is not owed to us. His mercy is not a guarantee to us. Now, let's go a little bit further. Boys and girls, I want to speak to you for a moment. Often in church, we'll sing various songs. Some of them might be older and some of them might be newer. I want to draw your attention to the last song that we sung this morning. That song, It Is Well With My Soul. Now with older songs, one of the beauty, one of the beauties of that song is the context behind the words. That hymn, Boys and Girls, was written by a man called Horatio Spafford. Now Horatio Spafford was a man who lived in the United States, and he had quite a lot of properties, and he was quite a successful businessman. But he lived in a time when there was a great fire in the city, and quite a lot of his properties burnt down. And so they thought it was best as a family to relocate to the United Kingdom. But Horatio needed to stay at home in order to finish up the family affairs. And so he sent his wife and his daughters on a ship to go to the UK. Before the ship arrived in the UK, there was a tremendous accident, and all three of his children drowned. Only his wife survived. And so he received a letter from his wife saying, All are gone. I alone survived. Horatio then wrestles through this. He, as a father, is trying to take care of his family. And the best thing that they uh, think for themselves is to move to the UK so they can find stability and peace there. But in the very actions that he thought would bring him peace has brought him grief. His children die. And as he wrestles through that, what are the words of the song? When peace like a river Attends my way when sorrows like sea billows roll. Whatever my lot, God has taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. What is the second stanza in that hymn? The bliss, oh the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. It is well, it is well with my soul. Do you see what he's doing in that hymn? He's moving away from his circumstances, and he looks to the truth and the reality that God has accomplished on his behalf. Now, this morning... I want to apply one particular attribute of, the, of God's character to us as we think about grief. I want to draw out the nature of God's providence. The nature of God's providence. I think this is a wonderful truth that can help us as we think about this. So what is providence? Providence. I think the best answer I found to this is in the Westminster Shorter Catechism. Boys and girls, you'll actually study this catechism next year in your Sunday school class. But question 11 asks this, what are the works of God's providence? This is the answer. God's works of providence are his most holy, wise, and powerful preserving and governing of all his creatures and their actions. God's providence is not something uncontrollable. God's providence is not God sitting in heaven rolling the dice, uh, thinking about some outcome. God's providence in our lives is always holy. That means it is consistent with His character. And it is always wise. You see, that's the reason why, even though David has been told that his child will die, 
He knows and he can have confidence that God, in working out his providence, is always wise and always just. There is nothing un-God about God in the outworking of his providence. And so that's why David can then pray that God will be gracious to him. Because God is God. Let's apply this in our lives specifically. And if you want a a title for this subsection, I've entitled it The Grace of God's Providence. Friends, in the providence of God, there may be times when God reveals to you the timing of a loved one's death. Here, In 2 Samuel 12, it's the prophet Nathan who comes to David with the word of God saying to David that your son will die. In our cases, we might discover that we are diagnosed with a terminal illness. Maybe there will come a time in our lives when we we realize that we have advanced cancer and that nothing can be done. Perhaps there will come a time in our lives when we will discover that we have an incurable disease, maybe Alzheimer's or dementia. Maybe there will come a time in our lives when we will have to go a medical procedure where the risks may include death. Now, in God's providence, this is grace to us. In some instances, there will be families who decide if they find out that they have terminal illness or if they have an incurable disease, that they're going to keep this truth away from the person who uh, it has been diagnosed. Or, Or to simply say, well, you know, things need to get better or things need to get worse before they get better. It's cruel to do that. Because while one person is dying in ignorance, the family grieves their death even before they die. But... If God in his kindness reveals this to us, we can comfort one another with the truth of God's character. That God is kind, that God is gracious, that if God wills it, that he will allow us to go through these things in relative comfort and ease. As you experience the frailty of your body, Perhaps you might have weight loss, you you, you might lose your appetite, you may even at times be experiencing terrible and excruciating pain because you know that you're at death's door. Your mind becomes clouded, your eyesight begins to fade. What is comfort in times like that? Is it not that even in moments like these, that God is That God is wise, that God is holy, that God will never do anything that is contrary to the nature of his character. And that's, friends, what we always need to be comforting each other with. Just before Richard Olfson passed away, and some of you might remember this, at our evening service, one of the things that I prayed was this, Lord, Please restore his strength, or, Lord, help us to usher him into glory. How wonderful it would be for us if in our families or amongst our friends, God in his grace revealed to us the timing of death, that we would be in a position to usher those whom we loved to the very gates and threshold of heaven and then commit them into the Lord's hands. Sometimes, there may have been some of you who wish that you had one more moment to spend with your loved ones. One last moment to have a hug or Say how much that person meant to you. God may give to some of you that moment.
we ought not to squander it. The remedy to our grief is a clear view of the character of God. Hold on to that truth. And point others to that truth. Now for a moment, I do want to pause because there is an inevitable question that we need to answer about this passage. I questioned whether or not I should even include this, but I think For the sake of of dealing with the text, we must. What happens to children when they die? What happens to those who are aborted, those who only live for a few days, a few months, and then the Lord calls them home? How do we deal with that from a passage like this? Well, ladies, I think you at the ladies' meeting dealt with part of the solution to this. You might have heard yesterday that there are some passages in Scripture that are descriptive, and there are other passages in Scripture that are prescriptive. There are passages in Scripture that simply tell us what happened, and there are other passages in Scripture that seek to teach us some doctrinal truth. Now that's important because in 2 Samuel chapter 12, the author is simply telling us how David is responding to the death of his child. The author is not telling us what happens in every instance to a child who dies. There's a great difference there. So in order to answer this question, we can't simply derive it from this passage. We need to look elsewhere to do so. The first place that we're going to look at is in Romans chapter 1. You know this well that in Romans chapter 1 we see that there are two ways in which God reveals himself. The first way that God reveals himself is through general revelation, through the things that have been created. And in the things that have been created, what do they reveal about God? His eternal power and his divine nature. The second way that God reveals himself is through special revelation. The scriptures, the the gospel that God has given to us. So if God reveals himself through creation and the gospel, to what extent could those children who have died in the womb, or those children who may be very young, actually understand or perceive those things? Even those with mental disorders, to what extent can they understand the gospel or to what extent can they perceive the works of creation? We don't really know, do we? We know for the child that's unborn that they haven't been exposed to this at all. But the second thing that we need to understand is that children are not morally innocent. What do we read in the book of Romans? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And what is the consequence of sin? Death. The the fact that children die is a sign that they're all under the condemnation of of God. They're, They're all judged. In Psalm 51 and verse 5, The psalm that David writes after his sin with Bathsheba, he says this, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. What is David trying to communicate there? He was communicating that he was a sinful person from the time that he was conceived. The, the, The nature of sin is something that we inherit because of Adam. And because we all have a sinful nature, we're all under God's judgment. So how then do we reconcile that? On one hand, children are not able to perceive God's revelation. And on the other hand, we know that we're all judged. What way of salvation is open for children? Friends, the Bible doesn't actually answer that question. We might look to passages like uh, Jeremiah and even John the Baptist. When Jesus comes to him, he leaps in his mother's womb 
But we can't derive from those passages what happens to children. We read in other places of Scripture like Romans chapter 9, and this is a a helpful passage to deal with this. In Romans 9, when he speaks about uh, Jacob or or Jacob and Esau as as an example of God's electing purposes, Paul writes there, Though they were not yet born and had done nothing either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, because of his who called him, it was written, Jacob I love, but Esau I hated. How do we reconcile these things? The Bible doesn't actually give us any answers. But the solution to this grievance is the same solution which I just presented to you. We must cling to the character of God. In Genesis chapter 18, as God's about to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, and as Abraham intercedes before God, what does he say at the conclusion of that? Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just? God will never do anything that is in contrary to his nature. He will always do that which is right. In Psalm 145 and verse 17, we read that the Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his works. As we wrestle with our grievances against the Lord, what admonishes us is the word of God as he reveals his character. So thirdly and finally, let's think about processing grief In the presence of God. As David finds out what God's judgment is upon his child, what does he do? He flees from Jerusalem, he goes to Syria and starts doing something else. No. He doesn't flee away from God's presence, does he? He flees to the Lord. It was to the very one who pronounced judgment that David ran to. It was before the Lord that David fasted and prayed and humbled himself. And he does this, as we saw already, precisely because God is kind and gracious. Why? Because we saw earlier, didn't we, that David is the one who's guilty. David is the one who must die. He's the one who needs to face the penalty. He has broken God's law. He has violated God's commands. He's the one who deserves death. And yet the Lord extends mercy to David. The Lord forgives David of his sin. And when David confesses his sin, I think it's such a wonderful Example for us that that confessing our sin and repentance doesn't need to be this long, drawn-out thing with pages and pages of prayers. David just acknowledges his sin before the Lord. There might be some of you here today who don't know the Lord, and you might think to yourself, but in order to be made right with him, I need to do this, and I need to do that, and I need to do the next thing. Well, David simply says, I have sinned against the Lord. And he's forgiven. If David, who is guilty, is the recipient of grace, it is because of that that he can plead to the Lord to be gracious to his child. Friends, church, my brothers and sisters, I want to encourage you that as you process grief, do it in the presence of God. Do it in the presence of God by yourself, as you're alone in your room, in the the quiet that you experience. But do it with God in the presence of your brothers and sisters in Christ. As we come together and as we point one another to the Lord. David gives himself to prayer. He gives himself to prayer in the presence of the elders of his home. He commits to communion with God. 
So while prayer might be one of the hardest things to do in grief, it is a vital thing to do in grief. Secondly, worship. The loss of a child can be an excruciating experience. And for those of you who have experienced something like that, I don't want to presume what that looks like. It is tremendously painful beyond what words can articulate. And in those moments, as I shared with you, we may become angry. We may become fearful. We may doubt the goodness of God. And even though we might want to present a balanced facade before others, there may even be a seed of anger within our hearts. I have heard of instances where after people have lost children, that they've turned to ungodly forms of counsel. Whether it's been drug abuse or alcohol abuse, maybe they've sought sympathy from others in inappropriate ways. if we are genuinely converted and if the fruit of the Spirit is evidenced in us, what does David do? He arose and he went to the house of the Lord and he worshipped God. How can he do that? How, How can David, after experiencing all that he has experienced, go to the very presence of God and perhaps sing song to him like we do? Well, it is because while God judges sin, while God forgives sin, while God in his providence may not answer our prayers, he is still God. And that's why it's so wonderful for me as as I go through this series and even as I experience the loss of my father last year to be with God's people. Because as you're singing next to me, as my throat gets a frog in it, and as as my eyes tear up, you're singing and you're encouraging me. You're, You're helping me to look to the Lord because He is my comfort. He is my hope. He is the one whom I trust to return. And then in a moment, a few weeks down the line, as your throat is choked up, and as you begin to tear, I'll sing next to you, and I'll help you to look to the Lord. I want to conclude, but I realize that my conclusion might be another point. As we wrestle through this passage, we inevitably ask ourselves, why didn't God spare this child? That's a question I have. That's a question you might have. Why didn't God spare my loved one? Why didn't God spare my child? Why? What is the reason for this? As I studied this passage, one of the things that I realized that what's at stake here is not simply the life of a child, but the reliability of God's word. Have a look at verse 14 again. Nathan says to David, Because by this deed you have utterly scorned the Lord, the child who is born to you shall die. Is that a conditional statement or an unconditional statement? You see, Nathan doesn't say to David, unless you repent, the child will die. Or if you do something that that exposes your sin, the child will die. Nathan simply says the child will die. It's unconditional. There is a sense in which God has spoken and nothing can change that. Now there are passages in scripture that are conditional. As we read of in Isaiah, as God exposes um, the nation's sin to them, uh, one of the things that he says as he begins to call them to repentance uh, is in verse Later on in in the passage, he says in verse 18, Come now, let us reason together. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become white as wool. What's the transition there? Well, it's repentance. It's conditional. Though you have sinned, you will be forgiven if you repent. And that's the principle. 
It's a conditional, uh, it's an unconditional statement. God has spoken. He will not change his mind. Now, go back in your Bibles to 1 Sam, or 2 Samuel chapter 7. 2 Samuel chapter 7, and I just want to read from verse 12 to verse 16. This is God's covenant with David. He says to him, when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish his, the, 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 sorry, I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men. But my steadfast love will not depart from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. So same question. Is that a conditional promise or an unconditional promise? What's well, an unconditional promise, isn't it? God is saying to David, I will do this regardless of how you respond. And so, if God had relented from following through with his word with David's child, could God be trustworthy when it comes to his promise to David in 2 Samuel chapter 7? If we cannot trust God on one account of his revelation, can we trust him on any at all? Now, as we come to an end, I want to draw out one more thing from this passage. Who is this passage in 2 Samuel chapter 7 speaking about? Is it speaking about Solomon, perhaps one of the other kings that come from David? Is it speaking about one of the kings that reigned in Israel during the time that the nation was split to the northern tribes and the southern tribes? No. Second Samuel 7 is speaking about Jesus. It's speaking about God whom will send his son into this world to take sin upon himself. In 2 Samuel chapter 12, we read the record of a child who dies and we don't even know that child's name. Yet, when God speaks about Christ, he says in Isaiah 9, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. In in, in Philippians chapter 2, we read that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So while this passage would be a passage that speaks of tremendous grief, it's also a passage that helps us to prepare for the incarnation of Christ the one who is our living hope, the one who takes away our sin, the one who makes us as pure as wool and as white as snow. And friends, I trust that this is the Son of God whom you are looking to, to help you in your moments of grief. Well, let's pray together, and I, just in the next few moments, just quietly reflect on what the Lord may have spoken to you about, and then I will close. Our Father in heaven, we thank you that you are the living God. And we thank you that because you are living, you give to us all that we need in this life. We thank you, Lord, that in the midst of grief, you give us comfort. We thank you that in the midst of pain, you give us strength. We thank you in the midst of fear, you give us hope. And we thank you, Lord, that these things are true because you are God. And that you will never do anything that is contrary to your nature.
Help us, Lord, to trust you for this. Lord, as we make our way through this series and grief and perhaps as these old wounds that have been opened, perhaps as there are for some wounds that are still healing, we pray, Lord, that your word and your spirit would grant to so many amongst us a sense of great care and a sense of great comfort as they look to you as their God. Lord, particularly now over this Christmas season, as perhaps a sense of family is uh, so close to us and as grief might have a, a particular resonance, we ask, Lord, that you be gracious. And even as we look to Christ, as we look to the incarnation, Lord, give us hope, we pray. Now, may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, for all, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. Amen.